Good morning. Welcome to worship here at St. Mark's Lutheran Church in Jacksonville, Florida on this, the second Sunday after Pentecost. We now transition into a season of growth in our church here, a season of green. In the next 20 or so weeks, until our liturgical calendar cycles back to Advent, we will spend time deep in God's Word, learning about the stories of Jesus in light of His death and resurrection and ascension and the gift of the Spirit at Pentecost. We now read Scripture again with new lens, new interpretation, new eyes to see God at work through Jesus Christ. Many of our weeks will be dedicated to the parables, the teachings of Jesus. And so this is a season of growth. That's why it's green. So welcome, wherever you are, to worship this day. We're glad that you could join us virtually for this service, and I hope that God is blessing you and your family in this time. As we prepare for worship this morning, I invite you to prepare your holy space. Make room for worship. Dedicated space, maybe with a cross or the family Bible. A time of quiet, and be light a candle. Whatever it is that you do, now is the time to prepare for a place of worship. As we enter into God's word, read, sung, prayed, and heard, and proclaimed. As we receive the spirit of the gift and breath of God to fill us in our very lungs with God's being, that we might overflow with goodness of God's grace. This is worship, and we join together in praise and thanksgiving, for our God is good. So now, my friends, let us prepare our hearts, our minds, our body, and our souls for worship, with the music of the prelude.
Our service begins with an order of confession and forgiveness found on page 3 of your bulletin. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God. We confess that we do not trust your abundance, and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse our good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us, and in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you.
let us pray. God of compassion, you have opened the way for us and brought us to yourself. Pour your love into our hearts that, overflowing with joy, we may freely share the blessings of your realm and faithfully proclaim the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. As we begin the season after Pentecost, what is often known as ordinary time, or this green season of growth, we'll be spending our lectionary calendar in the Gospel according to Matthew. For the next 20 or so weeks, we'll read passages of Scripture about Jesus at work, and we'll do so with a lens now that is of the resurrection of Christ, the ascension, and the gift of the Spirit at Pentecost. We'll hear God's words spoken through parables and stories of healings and miracles, teachings of Jesus. At the same time, we'll also be following what's called a semi-continuous reading of the Old Testament. Rather than skip around as we might normally do with the Old Testament, we're going to keep a red thread in the story of Genesis and Exodus and parts of Deuteronomy. We'll slowly work our way through those chapters as the weeks go by. So, that is to say for you at home, it's good to earmark the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and the book of Matthew, the first gospel in the New Testament. Earmark those because we'll return to them week after week in the same sections as we slowly move through them. And it's good for you at home to read and reread, to read the stories before, after, and in between each of our lectionary texts. So take time to do that now. Open to Genesis and open to Matthew as God's word is read aloud. A reading from Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant, who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk in the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh yes, you did laugh. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. God gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, Who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. <laughs>
from Romans. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope and hope does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God.
the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew in the ninth and 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, <clears throat> James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon of Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go gather rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave the house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them. For they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me, as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you at that time, for it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father is speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father to a child, children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated, all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And lately I keep thinking what an interesting time it is for us to be church. To be the body of Christ in the world, uh, you know, especially in this, this once in a lifetime kind of pandemic experience where we're dispersed community into the world, forced to quarantine. What does it mean for us to be the church? And what an interesting time we live. Right? What is the church's witness? What is our proclamation? What is our testimony in this time? How do we be church for the world? And I think it's really caused us to think about what is most important to us within our faith. What, what aspects of worship and community and church are most necessary or vital to us to, to understand and appreciate, to embody God's grace and God's love, to, to be part of the faith. I think this is a really interesting time for us to be the church.
Now, I, I know coronavirus is kind of a low hanging fruit in that conversation because it's palpable at this moment, but there are so many other things going on in our world that, that make it an interesting time for us to be the church. I, I think about climate crisis and how more and more we learn about our actions today and, and how they affect the world around us and our future generations. I mean, what is the church's response? How do we engage theologically into the conversation of ecological stewardship? What is our witness? Think about the events of the last few weeks that have um, really shed some light onto the cracks in our world. Cracks in systems of power and justice, cracks in our families and our relationships, cracks in our understanding of one another. And, and so what is the church's voice? How do we engage theologically in perspective of the body of Christ into the world in that time? What is our responsibility? What is our voice to be nonpartisan when every single thing we say seems to be so politically charged? How do we bear witness? How do we bear witness to the love of Christ? I think it's such an interesting time to be the church right now. You know, uh, that more than we want to ask or seek or imagine that, that when we look around at every news cycle in every corner, there's just so much pain and grief. So much hurt. And I wonder what is our, the body of Christ, the church's response? What is our way of engagement? What is our proclamation in this interesting time? makes me think about Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, you know, famous passage, right? That for everything and every time, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to plant, a time to pluck up, a, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to weep, and a time to mourn, a time to dance and throw away, a time to seek and a time to lose, to keep and throw away, to tear and to sow and to keep silence, and a time to speak. It, for everything, every time there is a season. So maybe actually for the church, this interesting time, we'd be better served to think of it as a season. What an interesting season this is. You know, the church year, our church calendar, is a series of seasons. Our life of worship in the church is centered around a series of seasons. We most know seasons by the weather patterns, right? Summer, winter, spring, and fall. We understand that each of those time periods are, are based in the lunar calendar and, and that there are ebbs and flows to the temperatures and, and the weather patterns. And, and then there's seasons of television shows or seasons of sporting events, right? Common understanding of the word season. But beyond that, in its most foundational level, season, the word season, is to mean a proper and suitable time. It's an, an indefinite or unspecified period of time, a while. It means to rest in a season. Like Ecclesiastes, for every time and everything, there is a season, an unidentified, indefinite period of time. And so in the church year, we have seasons. And so in its most general form, in the seasons of the church year, as we start with Advent and the season of blue, a season of, of waiting and anticipation of, of, of the second coming and the coming of Christ and the, and the birth of Jesus, and we get to Christmas morning and the week of Christmas, we celebrate the Emmanuel, God with us. And then a time of epiphany season, a manifestation of Christ, a celebration that God has come near in the person of Jesus, that God is present and active among the people. And we move into a time of Lent, into purple, a season of introspection and self-reflection, of deep growth and, and confession and forgiveness, a time of repentance, returning to God, to recognize our mortality, that in God we are but ash, and to ash we shall return. And then we celebrate Easter morning, and seven weeks in, of the season of Easter until Pentecost, which we celebrated two weeks ago, the gift of the Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit dancing in tongues like the rush of a mighty wind. And then we begin this season, this long green season. 
the time after Pentecost. Sometimes we call it ordinary time, but it is no ordinary time in the sense that it's plain and simple. It is this extensive and intentional season of growth. Right, A time when we now with a new lens, with the lens of the death and resurrection of Christ, with the Spirit given at Pentecost, with, with the ascension of Jesus, the command to go forth into the world, to, to all the corners of the earth and bear witness to what God has done, is doing, and will continue to do, we now reread, reinterpret, re-envision, re-engage Scripture and the work of Jesus in His life and ministry with that lens. And it's ordinary time because as Christians, as people baptized in the water, we're always about growing in faith. That is our ordinary. That's what we do, what we're called to do, to engage the work of God in the world, to be about growth, growing in love, growing in mutual care and support, growing in service, growing in our love of God, our love of neighbor, growing in faith. And so as we think about seasons of the church here, the use of the word season, I think, is intentional because it is a time, a specific time for a specific purpose. Right? Like blue, Advent, a time of reflection and anticipation of the coming king. Blue being royalty and waiting for Jesus the Messiah to be born. We celebrate Christmas, which is white, a, a color of celebration and great victory to celebrate the Messiah now incarnated in the world, God present. Then we celebrate Epiphany, right? It's a green season. It's a manifestation of Christ. Christ being made known to the world as we grow and learn into a way of what it means for God to be present and active. These colors are intentional, right? Purple, a season in Lent of, of introspection and reflection. Purple also meaning royalty and, and waiting as we think about our sin and we confess to God we follow Jesus to the cross and to his death. Easter, a, a white celebration season of reflection uh, of the great work of God. Jesus' resurrection, a light proclaimed to the world and a light that shall not go dark because light extinguishes all darkness. Red for Pentecost, the, the flames divided like tongues of fire, the rush of a mighty wind, the gift of the Spirit into the world to go forth, the power to go into all nations to proclaim Christ. And now the season after Pentecost, a season of green, of growth, a season of our ordinary action of faith that is growing in love. In our gospel text today, from the gospel according to Matthew in the ninth and 10th chapters, it's where we step foot now into this long season of green, this ordinary time. And it's appropriate to do so because we just learned about Jesus' death and resurrection. We learned of the ascension and the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and, and the commissioning of the disciples to go forth into all the corners of the world and to testify and be a witness, to bear witness to the work of God in the world, to proclaim a message of love and grace and hope. What an interesting time for them to be the church, right? And so now we re-engage scripture with that lens. We begin in the ninth chapter where Jesus commissions the apostle and sends them out. And Jesus says, I give you all authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every disease and to cure the sick. Jesus gives them the authority to do this. And, and Jesus knows that it won't be easy. In fact, he says, I'm sending you out like sheep among the wolves knowing full and well that this gospel message of love and deep inclusion of hospitality and overwhelming welcome, that the world won't always be ready to hear it, that those the disciples will encounter will be met with resistance. Like sheep among the wolves, not everyone will be ready to hear the gospel message of love, of truth, of hope, and of grace from God. It will be challenging for them challenging for us. What an interesting time, an interesting season to be the church. I mean, just like those early disciples into a world in desperate need of a new message of hope and love, we too are called like sheep among the wolves to proclaim a message that not everyone is always ready to hear. And we have this gift, this responsibility, this call actually to step into a world of pain and encourage growth. 
The time after Pentecost may be the last season of our church here, but it is a season with a purpose. It's the longest season of our church here, and it's green. It's green for a reason because it's a time of growth. And in doing so, we identify the pains of growth, the ways that we're being called and challenged into new beings, being created new, right? Trimming and plucking and tending to the garden to, to, to take out the vines and weeds that suffocate and to bloom into new things, to, to prune away the old sins and the old ways of living and to grow into a new being, a new creation that God has intended us to be. It's an important season. It's a season we'll be in for a while. During this quarantine COVID-19 period, uh, my family and, and I, Sarah and Bennett, we planted a garden in our backyard to try again a season of growth with crops, <laughs> vegetables, right? Tomatoes and peppers and squash and zucchini and potatoes, garlic, we try. I think about how in the beginning it was just a bed of dirt we planted some seeds and some small plants with hope, hope that things would bud and grow, knowing full and well that there would be dead limbs along the way and failures and disappointments, that some of the fruit that yielded would not be good fruit and it would be plucked, but from that new fruit might grow. And so over the weeks, we watched it expand and grow and tower and the fruits that began to come of that labor are just awe-inspiring. And every single day we take Bennett, our almost two-year-old, we go outside to say hello to our vegetables. And Bennett goes to the garden so innocently and he claps for them. And he tells the veggies that he loves them, that they're doing a good job and he visits them. Unlike that garden, we too enter a season of growth. Knowing full and well that along the way there will be bad fruit, that fruit that needs to be plucked and trimmed so that new buds might shine forth. Good fruit might yield. There'll be vines that wither and need to be cut off so we might regain and grow again. Knowing full and well that, that powered by God, God claps for us and encourages us, offers us words of love and gay grace and forgiveness and tends to us. That God waters us and nourishes us and empowers us to rise above our own expectations knowing well that, that in the garden of life there is seasons of growing pains. Now those pains aren't a bad thing, but they mean that the Spirit is stirring within us in ways that disrupt our own understandings and beliefs, our own convictions and morals, that, that the Spirit is swirling within us to see and reinterpret things in new ways. Just like we engage the Gospel of Matthew again during this ordinary time, we too are called to a season of growth and reinterpretation to seek and understand what God is up to in our lives. And in doing so, we as the church might blossom and bud and grow into a world that is desperate for a witness of God's radical love and grace. Yes, we might sometimes go like sheep into the wolves, to be met with resistance. But nonetheless, God calls us forth to grow within ourselves and as a church and my siblings in Christ. What an interesting, what a beautiful, what a most vital time and season it is for us to be the church, for us to be witnesses to all of creation, for us to encourage the world to grow name of Christ. Amen.
united and anointed by the Spirit, let us proclaim with the whole church what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. Holy One, you bring us together and call us your own. Bless theologians, teachers, and preachers who help us grow in faith, following the examples of Basil the Great, Gregory of Nyssa, Gregory of Nazianzus, and the teacher Macrina, whom we commemorate today. Guide your church that we might be a holy people. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, the whole earth is yours. Where there is fire, bring cool air and new growth. Where there is flooding, bring abatement. Where there is drought, bring rain. Inspire us to care for what you have provided. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, we have created divisions you will not own. In places of conflict, raise up leaders who work to develop lasting peace and reconciliation. Encourage organizations and individuals who care for all forced to leave their homes. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, you care for those who are harassed and helpless. Protect and defend those who are abused. Heal those who are sick. Feed all who are hunger. Empower all whose voices go unheard. And help us respond to the pressing needs of our neighbors. Especially we pray for Andy, Angela, Angela, Barbara, Bill, Camille, Carolyn, Clay, Debbie, Dr. Allen, Elaine, Jenna, Habita, Hal, Jamie, Jim, Jerry, John, Julie, Julie, Karen, Karen, Keenan, Ken, Lee, Leslie, Linda, Lori, Marie, Maria, Mark and Susan, Maya, Mimi, Marion, Neil, Pam, Pastor Bernie, Pastor Bell, Patty, Paula, Pete, Philippe, Pam, Robert, Rosemary, Scott, Shirley, Towns, Wendy, Zachary, and for those we name aloud are in our hearts. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Holy One, you provide a plentiful harvest of gifts and resources. Prepare us to labor and gather the fruits of this congregation that we might discover new ways of living. Minister to us in our work that we do not lose heart. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. God, our peace and our strength, we pray for our nation and the world as we face uncertainties around the coronavirus. Protect the most vulnerable among us, especially all who are currently sick or in isolation. Grant wisdom, patience, and clarity to healthcare workers, especially as their work caring for others puts them at great risk. 
Guide us as we consider how best to prepare and respond in our families, congregations, workplaces, and the communities. Give us courage to face these days not with fear, but with compassion, concern, and acts of service, trusting that you abide with us always. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy One, you bring all people to yourself. We give thanks for the holy people who have gone before us. Sustain us in your mission until the day you bear us up to join the saints in light. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always, and also with you. Let us take time now to share peace with one another. Sure, you can share peace in the chat box here on YouTube, or I invite you in these interesting times to take out your phone and text a loved one hello. Maybe someone that you've been thinking about but haven't talked to in a while, or, or some distant relative or old friend, or maybe there's a broken relationship and this is the moment that God is speaking to you to grow in that relationship, to reach out. So take time right now. In our letter to the Romans today, Paul gives thanks that we are justified by faith and that we have peace in God through Jesus Christ and that through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. We boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. Paul talks about the stewardship of sharing the goodness of God. We boast in our hope to share the good news of Christ. Each and every week I am in awe of your faithfulness to the God's word, to each other, and to this community of faith. I thank you again week after week. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your careful and attentive, prayerful and incredible stewardship of the mission and ministry of this place. Thank you. It is by your financial contributions, it is by your care and love for one another in this world that we are able to continue this mission in this time of COVID-19 and online worship. So thank you. I invite you now, actually, as an act of stewardship to make your financial gift to St. Mark's Lutheran Church that we might continue to worship God in this place. Do so by mailing in a check to our office where it's counted and recorded each week. You can go online to www.stmarksjacks.org slash give now. On our website there, you can make a one-time payment or make reoccurring gifts if you like. You can also download the Give Plus app from any app store. After doing so, search for St. Mark's Lutheran Church or search 32207, our zip code. When you find our church, click the plus sign in the top right corner, and there you can make a contribution, again, a one-time or reoccurring contribution. In all things, financial and otherwise, we give thanks to God, that God has poured out in abundance God's gift of grace, of love, of creation, that we might all live and have and have in abundance. So thank you, God, and thank you to you. For the goodness of God's word, God's word incarnate in Jesus Christ, God's word poured out in scripture, read, sung, prayed, and proclaimed, let us give thanks. Let us pray. Praise and thanks to you, holy God. For by your word you made all things. You spoke light into darkness, called forth beauty from chaos, and brought life into being. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. By your word, you called your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gifts, freedom from captivity, water on the desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom for life with you. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. Through Jesus, your word made flesh, you speak to us and call us to witness. Forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of your self-giving love, for your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. Send your spirit of truth, O God. Rekindle your gifts within us. 
renew our faith, increase our hope, and deepen our love for the sake of a world in need. Faithful to your word, O God, draw near to all who call on you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen.
My dear siblings, go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. 